um, get started. So I will call this meeting of 413. And I have a script that I'm going to read for the first part of this. Um, due to the provisions of the governor's COVID related executive orders, which suspend certain requirements of the Brown Act, the Economic Development Subcommittee, which I just called to order, is conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website, as well as on today's agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during the agenda items or public comment will be able to do so by using the raise hand feature or pressing star nine on their phone. When called upon, they will then be given the ability to address the committee. And um, Madam Recording Secretary Eileen, would you please take the roll? Yes, uh, Chair Sawyer. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. There he is. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Eddie. So before I take um, public comment, um, I want to re remind the, the community and our uh, and our uh, the members of our meeting today that we we have dedicated ourselves to a less formal format. So um, the titles of council member are not necessary unless you feel more comfortable using them. Um, but we will be on a first name basis, uh, at least those on the, on the committee. And the, the public is, is, is encouraged and invited um, to maintain that, that same level of, of um, or that lack of um, formality that we so often have to deal with. Um, with with city meetings, we find that it works well to have that that formality removed, so that we can have a more open discussion. So, before we get started with the, with our agenda today, I will um, uh, ask for uh, public comments on items not on the agenda. Um, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please use the raised hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, please press star nine to raise your hand. Each speaker has three minutes. A countdown timer will appear for your convenience and please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of three minutes and council members um, also uh, make sure that your phone or that, that you're, you are muted um, unless you are ready to speak. Um, and um, Eileen, do we have any comments on items not on the agenda this morning? We do, Sarah. Ms. Borzewski, um, I have unmuted your line. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yes, I do. Um, my comments are though on the agenda on the right to call back. So I might've did this a little wrong. Yeah, we, that is on the agenda. So if you can okay. hold off, um, that I would will. be great until we get okay. to that item. Okay. Thank you. Eileen, any other um, comments on items not on the agenda? There are no additional raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll, we, we will move on to um, our agenda. 3.1 is the Economic Resiliency Council priority update. And Raisa, you're on. Hey there. Um, okay, so I wanted to put this on just to, um, to state what, um, there are a lot of things that we're doing that we don't generally talk about here or that don't maybe show up on, um, on our economic development subcommittee meetings, but we're busy. And um, so we can go into a little bit of detail on any of these if you'd like to, but I just wanted to put it into the public record. Um, and it basically breaks down into three, um, three kind of uh, segments, um, activities that, that are ongoing, um, activities that have a date certain with either this subcommittee um, and or uh, council, and then um, uh, activities that are um, that are coming up in the future that we've noted that we need to progress on, but we don't have a specific date for. Um, and so on the ongoing thing, and this was uh, this is related to the economic resiliency, including child care council goal. Um, and um, in terms of economic res resiliency, just baked into our program, um, you know, we're obviously continuing with small business support assistance and assistance coordination. We did highlight uh, Latinx business recovery, communication and opportunities, because um, again, we found that um, just an ongoing discrepancy in um, access to uh, assistance, access to resources um, is, uh, 
was sort of exacerbated during the COVID uh, pandemic. And so we highlighted um, and increased our efforts with uh, Latinx business recovery. Um, and then also micro entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, this can come in many forms. Um, what we're seeing right now is that a lot of people are um, starting small businesses either in their home or men, uh, mobile vending opportunities, um, that type of thing. So uh, we've increased our efforts in that area. And then also obviously ongoing is the pursuit of revenue and uh, partnership opportunities. So we saw that um, in the form of, um, for example, uh, Open and Out was a good example of partnering with other organizations to extend uh, what funds we have, but also to make the programs a little bit more um, robust or a lot more robust in that case. Um, the other thing that's ongoing that will eventually come in different ways through this committee um, are the downtown infill development uh, work that we're doing. So, you know, we're continuing our work with, uh, you know, Simon Properties regarding the mall, um, with uh, Cornerstone uh, Properties with whom we have an exclusive negotiation agreement uh, with, um, with other uh, interested parties in the downtown, either that they have property or they're seeking information um, or they're seeking to purchase property. Um, so uh, that's just gonna be an ongoing thing. We'll eventually bring that back to the Economic Development Subcommittee on its way for any action uh, to council. Um, but I wanted to sort of uh, point out the date certain things so that uh, folks um, uh, listening or on today um, know that we have some very specific uh, actions coming up. Um, actually, the first one is on the 27th, which is the study session for the government center. So um, this will be a study session probably, I'm going to guess, take about two hours. Sorry, council members. <laughs> Um, but it'll be interesting, and it'll, it's the first time we're actually going to be able to review the, uh, the report, the feasibility analysis that JLL did, um, really specific to our City Hall campus and our, uh, the city's administrative uh, needs to be able to consolidate them, and then, while also um, freeing up land for new development in the downtown uh, geared toward housing. But also going to be there is Caroline Judy. Um, from the county because we need to ask some very specific questions um, about the, the uh, council's uh, interest in accommodating uh, the potential for the county uh, administrative center to move downtown as well. Um, so that's on the 27th. On the uh, May 25th, um, we're uh, anticipating having, it's well, I'm calling it shared right of way, but it's really specifically the parklets. We're anticipating that the, um, the uh, COVID restrictions will ease up and we'll get into the yellow tier uh, mid-June. Uh, and this is an effort for us to be able to accommodate the uh, COVID temporary uh, parklets that we've, we've uh, set out to be able to have a permanent program um, that will carry forward. And so it's such a, a nuanced uh, rabbit hole of a policy um, that we felt that we needed to do a study session before we actually commit to uh, presenting a, um, an actual ordinance. And that's because you know, we think most frequently about downtown and what the infrastructure looks like here, but this policy needs to be a citywide policy and to be able to uh, uh, roll out, um, again, equitably as best we can throughout the city. Um, also in May, just so you know, we anticipate the start of our Economic Development Division strategic, uh, stra uh, strategic plan. We haven't done this for a long time. Um, there's been so many organizational changes as well as the need for us to, um, you know, sort of reconnect and confirm or reorient our priorities. So that'll start in May. And then this last section, we sort of go into more date uncertain or future items. Um, we are in the process of talking about enhanced infrastructure finance districts. Um, we're looking at two areas, which happen to be also our opportunity zone areas, and that's in the downtown in Roseland. Um, and so we've been meeting with the Board of Supervisors 
to understand um, what their concerns uh, might be and um, at what level they might be interested in participating. Um, another thing that we have coming up is um, the, uh, the uh, RFP, uh, the request for proposals or request for qualifications for um, select downtown properties. Really specifically, we're looking at um, lots 10 and 11, which are the fifth street lots behind um, Russian River Brewery and uh, the one down on uh, between B and Mendocino. It's on um, fifth street. Um, so there are two small lots as well as the um, garage on third street. Um, that garage and those two lots um, need uh, a lot of work. <laughs> um, so they have uh, millions of dollars worth of retrofit uh, issues. Um, and um, so we have an opportunity if we release them for um, public um, development while also um, recognizing that we need to retain our public parking. Um, it gives us an opportunity to address uh, two needs with one stone. Um, and then um, I'm hoping to come and start working with this group on the child care pil uh, support pilot program. Really specifically, um, we need to get to start on the next phase, which is the facility fund. Um, I have this idea that I've been sort of uh, talking to people and seems to have uh, interest in doing something like we did with Red for Housing, but um, a, 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 an organization um, that may be a JPA that will help sort of like a housing trust for childcare facilities. Um, because what we're finding, uh, we noticed that that obviously you guys have supported um, the loss of childcare, trying to stabilize childcare through the pandemic, but we're finding that um, even finding facilities, if we have providers, is becoming more and more difficult that are uh, qualifying facilities. Um, and then the last thing I want to just point out on this list is the Roseland Community, Community Benefit District. So we have two community benefit districts, they're, uh, they're property-based assessments um, that uh, we have in Railroad Square and Courthouse Square. Um, we're looking at, um, at introducing this concept to Roseland, um, and so we're laying the groundwork now. I hope it's not going to take a full year, but um, in anticipation um, that with the work that we're doing with the businesses and then eventually those businesses in coordination with the city will do with the property owners, we hope to be able to uh, introduce a new community benefit district um, for that area uh, later this year or, or sometime next year. Um, and that's, that's uh, the update on these. If you guys have any questions on any of the items. Thank you, Raisa. And I can't see, um, there we go. So just raise your raise your actual hand uh if you counsel if you have any questions on this update victoria uh, i'm just curious um what first of all thank you so much for uh sharing with us the tremendous amount of work that you do yeah. i i don't uh i guess my my rhetorical question is i don't know how you how do you do it all um but the actual question i have is um what if any role do you see for uh, um this committee um around the facilities trust because as and it's probably no secret to you or anybody on this um, Zoom that I, I have a particular interest in wanting to know if there's any way to participate. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I, I will propose it for next, um, the next uh, subcommittee agenda in May, um, because I think we need to start picking apart. I, I mean, honestly, how do we do it? I cannot do this without you guys. For one thing, um, the, uh, I'm going to need help just with the connections. Um, we have $1.4 million left from the, uh, seed money that you, that you gave us, um, for the pro program in general. Um, that's not enough to create something, but it's enough to leverage. So how do we leverage that? Um, who do we work with? Um, what, what, you know, can we do a JPA or where's the best place to put it? I think we're going to have to, like, that's the hard work we're going to have to do with you guys. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my concern coming out of that is just how how, how are we going to um, potentially get some more, you know, money for either American Recovery Act, other jurisdictions and, and um, potentially, you know, non-governmental sources. So really excited to work on that. Thanks. 
Yeah, and start thinking now, Victoria, honestly. <laughs> because I think um I think we 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 know the obvious players. Um so first five, um uh oh my gosh, I'm blinking out of these, um, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we're working on that now, but it's um it's how do we access and engage and again do for housing, uh uh do for childcare what we did for housing, how do we get additional money from say Kaiser? Maybe it's Kaiser Family Foundation. Maybe it's even uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, healthy communities kinds of things. Um, but the the other thing is, so it's that phasing and then where's the best place to have an, a, a program like this run? If we can get county, like multi-jurisdictional funding um, and uh, while acknowledging like return to source type of questions. I think the, that, that sort of like picking apart what we need and then creating that strategy to get there is what I'm anticipating for next, uh, for May. Okay, thanks. Eddie, any questions about the update? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was just answered. And for me, the biggest concern is how do we fund all the programs that we wanna invest into? Uh, so, so thank you for that, Raisa. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. And, I, and we have, you know, the developer that is looking to include childcare in his development uh, and having those conversations with developers downtown uh, is, you know, one of those is the type of thing that we will be looking at and in encouraging those that are uh, risking their, their capital to come downtown uh, are also, uh, at least in part, highly engaged in some of these um, kind of almost unexpected uh, awarenesses of how important childcare is to to the economic health um, and just the health in general of our community. So um, it's it's becoming, and I think that probably education uh, there's going to be a key element of educa educating the, the community on the on the importance, so that there's a higher level of awareness and support. Um, I certainly needed the the education myself, so uh, I'm I'm hoping that 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 those are part of the conversations when we when we go down the the. Um, the, down the road of talking to developers and what their intentions are for developing downtown. You know, and I, I, I will point out too, Eddie, we're gonna need your help. I think um, in particular on the community benefit district, this is an assessment tool that will help create an organization um, and then provide funds for that organization to do really, uh, you know, community benefiting work in that area. Um, and so I think uh, Raphael, um, he led the charge for Rowood Square, the last one, um, and obviously is the boots on the ground for, um, for Roseland. Uh, so we'll continue to talk with you about that as well. And that uh, will generally come through this or this committee before council. Well, I appreciate that very much. And any opportunity that I that moving out of the, the, the stages of COVID, um, I'm definitely looking forward to being able to interact with my community at a whole another level. It almost feels like a new level and that we're getting to know our neighborhood now that, that the sun is rising once again, right? So no, I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, okay. And Roseland is the, the natural um, next um, step in, in those organizations. And I think it's, I think they are, you know, awaiting it, awaiting, awaiting the opportunity. And it is, it is, it, there's, there's a lot of work that, that goes into creating these districts, but it'll be well worth it in Roseland. And then there'll be a lot of education as well. You know, and yeah. that's part, part of the deal. And you pointed to the fact uh, that we're become, becoming educated. And as, as, as business uh, people, we actually had this conversation, I believe it was the, the meeting before the last, where, where as business people, we definitely have to recognize the importance of childcare and how that influences our success as business people. And I believe uh, Roseland being very strong in the labor force, as well as the Blossom uh, Economic District, it, it definitely adds power to that statement. Exactly. Good point. Uh, Matt, uh, John, I just want to add one more thing to what mm. Eddie is saying about um, Roseland's role, especially with childcare, which is that, um, you know, when, when we do our census tracts and all that stuff, which happened, of course, before the fires, but uh, one of the things that does, that, that we, we divide things up based on, um, partially based on voters, um, but children aren't voters, obviously. And I, and I have a, a strong suspicion just from when I walk around Roseland that there are more children in Roseland than, than any other district. And so I think that that's gonna be a really important focus to make sure that our facilities are equitably located um, and that our business owners, which are more commonly women of color, 
um, in the in the childcare industry are are properly supported. And so we'll need your support, Councilmember Alvarez, Eddie. Sorry, <laughs> um, in in doing that so that we we get this right. Yeah, and, that's, and, and that's right. Absolutely. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sir. No, that's okay. Go ahead, Eddie. Well, I was going to say, absolutely, if, if you look at our schools, if you look at historically, even historically, when you look at neighborhoods, uh, the, the, the blue collar worker, the labor force, that is where the, the, the families are beginning. So it absolutely, it, I couldn't see it any other way. Uh, too bad that we're looking at the numbers before the fire. And now we're seeing the reality after the fire. But I completely agree with that statement that, that when you look at District 1, it is a lot of these startup families that we're seeing. So absolutely. Yeah, and then, you know, the bulk of childcare is actually um, of the child care slots there and home-based um, childcare. And so we were able to at least help accommodate some of that through training, um, the trainings that 4Cs does, and then the grants that, um, that First Five does. But this um, facility fund, oh my gosh, it's like if we can take down additional barriers to entry to that next step or for, um, for childcare. And again, it goes uh, predominantly to um, underrepresented communities uh, they, uh, who step into this space and they can create their business from that. Raisa, just because um, it wasn't immediately clear with me, would you take 30 seconds and say what the a facilities fund means? Yes. Because it's not obvious from the title, except it isn't think about like a space, but like it's not it's not exactly as building spaces. Right. No, it's um, it's OK. So I'm just trying to think because I wrote out the whole blurb on it, and I said, but I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's the short version of it? Um, OK, so the, basically the goal of the facility fund is to leverage the one point four million uh, seed funding that council gave us. Um, through a broad base of local, state, and federal funds and policies to create sustainable program involving, uh, you know, mutual assistance. Um, and it's working towards uh, not only stabilizing the, um, the industry, uh, but it's specifically through this fund, stabilizing them by giving them access that is affordable in the long run um, uh, uh, for new facilities. So it could be either upgrading existing facilities. So if, if you think about it like, um, like affordable housing, we look to retain what affordable housing we have. So um, upgrading existing, um, and then we look to build new. And so we're looking to replicate that model. So building new means that from a policy standpoint, say in downtown infill development, um, it's allowable and it's a community benefiting use but it's really expensive to build because it's very specific. How do we decrease the cost of that in the same way that we do for affordable housing so that a provider can afford it and so that um, the, uh, the uh, reduced cost of the facility um, is passed on to, uh, to families um, or, or for the service itself so that it can be a sustainable service um, on both sides. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I, I think of it honestly like affordable housing. It, that's a really great way to look at it, it like affordable housing. Um, um, but, you know, when we talk about like a facilities trust going forward, which is something that um, is a whole nother nuance, like it just, um, I'm just sort of preparing, like, you know, asking these questions to prepare us because like John said, there's such a steep education curve and I'm still on it. And I've been passionate about it for five years. And, and so it's, just something that, you know, thank you for indulging me, you guys, because I think we just need to kind of continue to talk about it because it's it's not as straightforward as it seems, but the housing is, is one good way to do it. The other one way to look at it, um, the trust part of it is, um, which is not the facilities fund that we're talking about today, is to look at like uh, agricultural easements and open space easements, which is a whole, we can say for another day. <laughs> but, yeah. But I mean, there's, that's the thing is that there's, there's really great existing models. Um, and I, I think the reason why I go with trust or we can go with easement, whatever it is, is because like with the housing trust, we, we have when we understand in concept what it does um, in terms of the funds and the release of the funds and the NOFAs or whatever. Um, but the other thing that's sort of interesting to me about it is that, um, is the, uh, like the housing choice voucher side of our housing program. So we also have that, but how do you increase that? So I think it really goes to all of it. It's to be both for the provider and for the user. 
But the easement thing is super interesting as well. I got to find another place for the sun. There we go. <laughs> right. And I could geek out on this for a few hours. So I know. we'll move <laughs> on. <laughs> well, I, I do want to uh, ask one quick question. You mentioned models. Is, are the models that you're referring to, are they specific to childcare or are these mainly um, affordable housing models? Um, they're mostly affordable housing models or like, again, open space models, the, um, the one that Victoria just uh, mentioned. Um, there is, uh, I think in San, uh, Santa Cruz, Clara County, I can't remember if it's San Mateo, Santa Clara. Um, they have something um, similar, but I, you know, I think from the council goal setting, there was a, a desire to, to get eventually to universal health care. I mean, to universal child care. Um, you know, it's these steps um, that can uh, enable us. And so I feel like even if Santa Clara is doing it, or even if um, you know, ag and open space is doing it or housing is doing it. Uh, can we take the best of all of those and make something that has not been seen before? And that, to be honest with you, is my mm. ultimate goal. Yeah, because if it, you know, if if we use um, affordable housing as as one of the as we are just now after all this time, after decades of work, really doing some positive steps in the in the, in in the in the in the arena of affordable housing. I trust that it will not take us that long uh, to get the ball rolling on, on childcare and, and, the, and the kind of program you're talking about because uh, we can't wait decades for that to happen. So we need to, we need to spearhead or we need to put as much attention on that, on that particular specific arena as we have on affordable housing in general. And then hopefully the stars will align because we, we really do need to prioritize that. Yeah, and you know, again, um, given uh, you know how stretched we are, and I'm not just talking about economic development. I'm talking about the chamber. I'm talking about first five, four C's. You guys, um, it it really is going to be all hands on deck. I mean, it is a priority, and it's got to be this consistent march towards that goal. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to hang my hat on your hope, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, at this point, we'll move to public comment. Eileen, is there anyone um, wishing to, to comment on this particular update? Uh, yes, we do have Ananda Sweet. Um, hold on just one moment. Let me just pull up the timer. Um, Ananda, your line is unmuted. If you would please confirm that you're able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. I am, thank you. Hi, this is Ananda Sweet with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you on this item you know, for your leadership and you know, recognizing childcare you know, as a real critical economic development opportunity for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, I would say uh, it, we've, um, I think you all received a message that you know the state's working on their master plan for early education and care and is looking at examples um, of, of what does work in childcare and innovative solutions. Uh, and their consultants, uh, from multiple companies heard from multiple sources that they should talk to us at the chamber. And I would say that is not just because of our work at the chamber, it's because of our partnership with you know, the city of Santa Rosa and our local resource and referral agency for seeds and first five uh, and the childcare planning council through the county. Uh, and so really it's, it's so largely because of your leadership, you know, this council, uh, Raisa de la Rosa, you know, her, her direct partnership. So I just, I wanted just to take the moment to thank you. And um, I think it's, uh, clear recognition that uh, once again, much like housing, I think Santa Rosa was really acknowledged as a leader in the state. Uh, we're hearing that more and more for, with child care. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm so grateful to each of you for your leadership, so thank you. Thanks, Ananda. And thank you as well to the to the entire chamber for their support. You know, it's, it's interesting to see where the support for this endeavor is coming from. And um, it's great that the, that the chamber is there um, working with us uh, for success. So thank you very much. Yeah, I just have to do a shout out to Ananda because I, I don't think I would know as much about this had she not a couple of years ago, um, you know, uh, invited me to participate as a partner in, in, a, uh, in a chamber led sort of effort on specifically on this item. So uh, Ananda is definitely a leader in this. Um, in this. So thanks, Ananda. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and to see, we can all learn. So you're, we're, we're all in this learning phase. Um, Eileen, any other comments on this item? No, we um, have no further raised hands, nor do we have any um, e comments or uh, phone messages for this item as well. Okay, thank you very much. In that case, we'll move to 3.2, which is the hospitality right to recall and right to retention discussion. Um, and we'll have a conversation about the um, 
the, the, the draft ordinance that, that, that we received a copy of that Petaluma um, create, or that was, I'm not sure who created it. Was, did labor come up with the, with the language in that, in that draft? Uh, yeah, um, I document? believe, yeah, both of these, they were proposed by labor to the um, city of Petaluma. Um, yeah, so I think that, that that's what that is. Um, and you know what, um, uh, Eileen, we don't, I think these are just attachments, but we don't necessarily have to pull them up right now. It might be easier for us to see each other first. Um, and then if we need to pull them up um, to show the example, but hopefully everybody has them uh, in front of them, their attachments are, okay. Um, yeah, so just to kick, to well, well uh, maybe to, to kick it off, could you, could, could you let us know where, because Petaluma, that it was given as a document. Where does Petaluma stand on this draft ordinance? Yeah, so um, I talked to, or well, I emailed with Petaluma last night um, and I confirmed with the staff there that um, they have not uh, presented this to council at all, either the ordinances, the, um, the right to recall or the right to retention. Um, and I was told it's a city attorney bandwidth itch issue um, that uh, the city attorney wanted to revisit the language uh, before, uh, before uh, presenting to council for consideration. Um, and so just leading into that, I mean, it, it, it was submitted to them. They haven't done anything with it. You know, what's interesting about it, in, uh, if I start with the recall first, um, you know, the, the uh, preamble is all, it's based on, or the premise is based on COVID. Um, so uh, one of the questions is, you know, with, the, with us expecting to be in yellow tier by uh, June 15th, um, how long is this, um, is the expectation for this uh, ordinance for either of the ordinances? And then um, the other question is that we're hearing um, across the board that hiring is an issue and that they can't find enough people. Um, so even if we have an issue right now in COVID for people being laid off, um, there's been, uh, you know, with unemployment historically low, um, prior to COVID, it was at 2.5 um, and uh, or hovering below three. Um, and now in COVID right now, the January unemployment figures were 6.5. Um, so for a, uh, anything, an unemployment rate anywhere between four to 6% is considered healthy. Um, so the lower rates are, you know, seen as potentially inflationary because uh, it, it uh, puts an upward pressure on um, on salaries and higher rates, of course, you know, uh, are, are problematic because they, they threaten consumer uh, spending. So even in COVID at this point where we're, where we're going, um, we're sort of within um, the range of healthy unemployment. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that before COVID, um, there were, uh, I was a, a, a fairly frequent topic of conversation every time we got a new hotel, where are we gonna get the, um, the employees? Um, so, so I just wanna lay that groundwork on this. I understand the intention of this, um, but I'm not sure with tourism, uh, the demand for employment within the hospitality sector, um, I'm not 100% positive this is um, a problem, uh, the answer to a problem um, that we have. Um, so um, Jeff is also on here and I can get, kind of go through some of the issues if you want, but I mean, I'm assuming you've read it and we can maybe either jump in or do you need any kind of summary? Well, you know, I'll, you know, I, and I will ask um, the, the members that, that very question. And, and I did, I, I'll just mention that I was a little um, surprised that although the, the language in the first, in, in the description and the uh, intention um, was very much COVID uh, centric. The actual ordinance had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, that was at least in the draft that was presented to Petaluma. So um, it's it, it is it was it was something that would be changing how the how the city conducts its business, and the um, and the amount of um, what the requirements that this ordinance places on businesses and the tracking, et cetera, was, uh, was definitely concerning to me. Um, I think in, in some ways it might require a, an HR director just to track the, the various requirements in this draft. And it is a draft and the things change very rapidly. So, it, and I'm acknowledging that, um, but the draft itself did give me pause. 
Um, Jeff, you want to, well, let's go ask the council first. So Victoria or Eddie, do you have any questions when you were, when you were reading the ordinance right off the bat? You know, I, I don't have questions um, right off the bat about the ordinance. Um, thank you. Okay, sure. Eddie? For, for me, it's implementation timeline. If we're looking that we're going to be moving into another tier by June 15th, when can we present this to our council members or fellow council members? When could be implemented? And will we even have this done before the June 15th? And then moving into the 90 day period, which uh, the, the, the ordinance speaks of, how would that affect us moving further out of the, the tiers? Good and question. Really, really, and really the statement might be, is it too little too late? Uh, and, and that's something to be discussed, right? Yeah, and, and um, uh, Raisa was mentioning the, the, the potential reality that it actually is not at, at this point is is not even um, necessary uh, given the given the, the high level of need um, for for employees um, Jeff do you have any any comment about the capacity of the, of our legal department and as far as dealing with um, this particular item so just to make sure we're all on the same page, there's two ordinances, the right to recall and the right to retention, and their scope is limited to hotels with 50 or more rooms. So that's the scope of it. The right to recall ordinance deals with layoffs, and there's a bunch of whereas provisions, and it's clearly intended by the drafters that it be a COVID-related response to folks who work for hotels that were laid off. Whereas the right to retention ordinance doesn't have the same whereas provision. So I, I don't know what the intent was of the drafters, but whether it was to apply to COVID or, or any time. So I'm not sure how much detail you want me to get into with, with regard to the specifics of the ordinance, but that's kind of a, a preliminary look. The right to retention deals with sales of the hotel. So there's certain, would impose certain requirements um, on the, the new a purchaser of the hotel with respect to the current employees. Do we know at this point how many hotels would be affected in, inside our city limits? Have we done that work? Um, I started to do it this morning. I think um, I, I don't have a concrete number for you, but um, we have a lot. I mean, we have the majority of the hotels in Santa Rosa, um, and I think there's a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe what we do, if 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 um, Eddie and, and Victoria, if you don't have any questions for Jeff or Race at this point, then maybe we just can go to public comment because we're still going to have to decide on how we uh, what we bring to council and when we bring it to council, um, if we bring it to council, etc. So uh, let, let, let's go to to public comment. Um, Eileen, do we? I know that we have at least one one uh, speaker. Do we have? Could, let's, can we start the public comment period at this point? Yes, uh, pardon me for just a moment. Um, Sarah uh, Borzewski, um, you have been unmuted. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yes, I can. So uh, my name is Sarah Borzewski. Um, I've lived in Santa Rosa for about 20 years now. Um, I've worked in hospitality um, my whole working life and I'm currently at the uh, Hyatt Hotel for the last 16 years. Um, I think it's very important to support um, the coworkers that haven't been called back. Um, I know you're talking about low unemployment numbers. Um, we need staff and I feel like uh, the company is kind of dragging their feet on hiring. Um, and I think it would be really important for them to be encouraged to hire back uh, the people that have, you know, worked for them and supported them as a company. I feel like it's now their turn to support us, you know, as employees. And the easiest way to do that is the right to um, call back. And, um, you know, like I mentioned last time, um, I was involved in the Tubbs fire. And when the community rallied around us and supported us, it was very important. And it was a very good feeling to know that my community, not only my friends and family had my back. And I think that, um, yes, we are winding down, but I think we do need a little bit longer um, to encourage companies to do the right thing and to um, call back the people that um, supported their company. It'll make us stronger as a community and stronger as a business. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Eileen, any other comments this morning from this item? 
Yes, we do. Um, caller 9114. Um, I have unmuted your line. And if you would please confirm that you are able to see the timer. Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Juanita Galipo. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. And I work as a banquet server, which is totally different than waitressing at the Higher Hotel Regency, Sonoma County, for more than 16 years, but having laid off since the start of the pandemic. <coughs> it's extremely stressful, not knowing if, will be allowed to go, if we will be allowed to go back to work when business pick up. Because at my age, 61, and there is a few more that work the same, I would not be able to find another job that pays enough to afford to live in California. I would have to move out of the state and away from my community, including my daughter and grandchildren. Considering that rents are extremely high and so are mortgages, it would be nice to know that our jobs are coming back to us. And uh, I'm coming back to my family at work since we spent too many hours together for many years. Uh, the working banquet is totally different because we work, uh, it's all everything being pre-ordered. And then we just we just work in big amounts of people, so that's why it's it's not the same as waitressing. And I have worked my all my most of my life in in basically in catering services or banquet services. So hopefully you can uh, you can um, we can have you back to support each other and to support uh, all the people that haven't been called back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you. Eileen? Hello? Sorry, yeah. I apologize. I needed to un unmute myself. Okay. Um, we do have an additional hand raise. Um, uh, Ty Hudson. Um, Ty, you may unmute your line. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Uh, yes. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, council members. Um, my name is Ty Hudson and I, um, I'm with Unite Here Local 2850, which is the hotel workers union in the East Bay and North Bay. Um, and we're here to urge uh, this committee to uh, forward this, these uh, ordinances to the city council um, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, as you know, um, the hotel industry has been one of the industries hardest hit by uh, by the pandemic and uh, and has been really affected by mass layoffs. And that goes for members of our union as well as non-union um, hotel workers. Um, while the the uh, unemployment rate in general in the economy may be in the single digits. Um, the the majority of hotel workers um, are still laid off. Um, I mean, by by which I mean over fifty percent. I would venture to say about seventy five percent of hotel workers are still laid off. Um, and while we're coming out of the pandemic, and everybody can see a light at the end of the tunnel, now is exactly the time um, that we need to in, ensure that as business expands, um, as business picks up. The workers who have worked at these hotels for for years and even decades, uh, including um, you know workers that you've just heard from, um, are are able to go back to work uh, and uh, and go back to the jobs that they've held for for years. Um, as you as you've heard, um, not being able to go back to the job that you've held for many years could be a huge disruption in people's lives and 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 a uh, a, a crisis, a temporary crisis like COVID could turn into a real permanent um, catastrophe and, and the permanent upending of people's lives. Um, so this is a small um, targeted surgical um, requirement um, just to tell hotel employers um, when you are bringing people back to work, when you need more employees, which is gonna be soon, um, bring back the people that worked for you before. Um, it's, it's common sense, it's fair, um, it's minimally burdensome. Um, these are just people who obviously the company felt were, were good enough to do the job before. 
um, and, and in many cases have done it for, for many years. Um, so it's just a, it's a basic fairness and it's very extremely similar. The draft you have before you is extremely similar to ordinances that have passed all up and down the state of California in San Diego and Los Angeles, um, other cities in Southern California, Oakland, Santa Clara, um, and is under consideration in Petaluma. Um, we have, uh, our understanding is that the, the uh, city council in Petaluma will, will take up a first reading of the ordinance uh, on Monday uh, of next week. Um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, and then, Ty, I'm going to ask you to, to wrap up because we're, um, our, even though our clock indicates um, something different, right? I think you've reached the end of the, of the comments. So if I can just get you to wrap, wrap up, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I, I saw that I was getting uh, you know, more and more, <laughs> more. <laughs> I was wondering what, what little fairy godmother was helping me with that. But um, I, yes, I'll wrap up. I just wanted to speak very briefly to the second ordinance, which is the uh, worker retention ordinance, also similar to ordinances that are in place in other cities in California and elsewhere um, that is designed to, to prevent mass unemployment due to hotel uh, sales or changes of operator. Um, we expect to see that a lot during the pandemic. It's true that it would also apply outside of the pandemic. Um, the AC hotel in, in, in Railroad Square um, is, for example, is currently for sale. Um, and again, a very common sense ordinance to, to keep the same people on the same business, even if the, even if the ownership changes. Okay. Um, and so we urge you to forward these to the city council as soon as you can. Thank you. But thank you, Ty. Appreciate it. Eileen, any other comments? I believe there were some more comments. I think she just needs to unmute okay. and then ask them. I apologize. Um, I did need to unmute myself. Ananda Sweet, um, you are able to unmute yourself. If you would please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I can see the timer. Thank you. Yes, Ananda Sweet, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Um, so again, I just urge that as you explore additional policies and regulations around employers and workforce, it's really crucial to understand any workforce problem we're trying to solve, uh, including the data to support its existence. It's particularly critical to take the time to ensure that any policy solutions that come from this process meet the intended purpose and avoid unintended negative consequences. To do that, you have to truly understand the consequences of any policy solution uh, and the impact of layers of new policy. Um, so I just urge you to take the time to do that. Specific to the right of recall ordinance, uh, this truly is a solution looking for a problem that does not exist. Hospitality employers are eager to rehire staff for a smooth ramp up to normal operations as soon as they're able, uh, and they're facing a workforce shortage. With more open positions than there are people to hire, any form of right of recall ordinance would only result in additional setbacks and delays. It would be extremely burdensome for employers who should be encouraged uh, rather than discouraged from reopening or ramping up to pre-pandemic staffing levels. Any ordinance that adds layers of process, time delays, loss of flexibility, absolutely represent an enormous burden and a cost to those employers uh, and when they can at least afford it. Uh, risk to further delaying or permanent loss of those positions rather than protecting them uh, and slowing rather than aiding our economic recovery uh, by damaging the hospitality sector's ability to recover you know, would also harm uh, our overall workforce and their, their opportunity uh, for those positions as soon as able. Thank you. Thanks, Ananda. Eileen, do we have anyone else in the queue? We do. Um, Brad Culkins is the next individual. Brad, um, if you would please unmute your line and confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Good morning, and yes, I can see the timer. Brad Culkins visits Santa Rosa. After speaking to many hoteliers, we actually believe this ordinance is, these ordinances are completely unnecessary. The hotels targeted under this bill are already bringing back employees who were laid off as those employees are already trained and familiar with the operations. In fact, our smaller properties have already brought back most of their employees. And as mentioned, the large properties indicate they cannot find enough workers to fill available positions. It is common sense and smart business practice to rehire known, trained and former employees who are laid off as a result of this state shutdown. 
These ordinances also completely slow down the employer's ability to rehire employees and micromanages the rehiring process by the burdensome provisions in the ordinance. Several of the provisions will only delay rehiring and increase costs on employers. For example, a failure to respond by an employee due to having found another job, moved, or lack of interest can hinder the business's ability to interview, hire, train new staff by two weeks or more, delaying the rebound from the pandemic. In addition, the state is proposing AB 84, which is similar to these ordinances. Having two ordinances in the same jurisdiction just adds to confusion, increases costs, and increases the state and local government administration time, and again, slows down the recovery. This ordinance would be better handled at the state level, allowing city council to focus on other pressing issues more important and more important issues instead of duplicating efforts. In summary, this ordinance is trying to solve a problem that does not exist. In addition, these ordinances would place undue hardship and actually delay the reopening and rehiring process on an industry that was one of the hardest hit during the pandemic, and again, increase government administration costs. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Eileen, anyone in the, in the queue? Yes, um, Mr. Jack Buscorn. Jack, if you would please unmute your line and confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yeah, good morning, uh, Jack Buckhorn. I can't see the timer, uh, Executive Director of the North Bay Labor Council. Uh, good morning, uh, council members and staff. Um, I uh, respectfully have to disagree with my friends from the chamber. Um, we've already heard from Ty Hudson and we know that the hospitality industry has at least 50% unemployment currently. I know that from the per capita I receive at the North Bay uh, Labor Council that uh, they do not have anywhere near the number of workers working right now uh, as compared to pre-pandemic. These uh, two ordinances are very simple. They just say hire back the people you already had. HR has all their contact information. There is no delay in getting that workforce back. They contact them, they're trained, they show up, they go to work doing jobs that many have done for 20 or more years. Uh, these provisions have been in many of the collective bargaining agreements that have been in place um, at union hotels. The problem is the statute of uh, time has run out because nobody expected folks to be laid off for more than three or six months, which is typical in most CBAs. So uh, now that we've been a year, there's still over 50% unemployment. We have a trained workforce that wants to go back to work, is ready to go back to work. There is no additional burden to make that happen. It's just common sense to do that. What we see happening are older employees who are at a higher pay rate uh, being um, not offered jobs as they become available uh, in an attempt to lower their unit labor costs to do work. Um, we just don't think that's fair to those workers. They'll be uh, not able to survive and live here in Sonoma County if we allow that to happen. So I urge you please to uh, move these uh, two ordinances forward uh, to the council so we can have a full uh, debate and uh, help these workers in their time of need. COVID is the reason they were laid off. We're coming out of COVID, thank God, but these workers deserve to have the jobs that they were offered. Uh, thank you for your uh, time this morning and I appreciate your consideration to move this, uh, these two ordinances forward. Thank you, Jack. Eileen, the ball is in your court. Yes, we have um, an additional speaker, Anna Sagado. Um, your line is unmuted. Would you please confirm that you were able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose? Hello? Uh, Yes, hi, we can hear you, thank you. Oh, okay, um, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Anna Salgado and I'm a co-chair on Norway Job with Justice. And I'm here today because I'm strongly support the proposed, the proposed ordinance to make sure that hotel workers can return to work safely and fairly. There are a lot of people in my neighborhood and in the Latinx community um, who work in hotels. And when COVID happened, many of them lost their jobs. 
And I see how it's getting harder and harder for people to pay rent, utilities, and like now you were mentioning before, um, childcare. And that's why I am here because I really worry about the future of all these families because their future is already compromised with all this pandemic. And also, I would like to make this um, comment about a previous comments that any extra ordinance to make sure that the workers' right um, can be implemented it cannot be unnecessary, you know, it's always um, in behalf of a show or um, solidarity to our essential workers. So that's why I'm really um, beg you to support this. And please let's be fair and let's get all together, you know, let's help each other to come up and, and to overcome this pandemic struggle. And on the name of all the workers, um, please, it's, it's good to ask them first, you know, the ones they already have their jobs before, ask them and check with them. Many of them are just very anxious waiting for that call. So thank you. Thank you very much for this um, minutes to express my concerns. Thanks, Anna. Eileen. Um, yes, um, that is our, oh, actually, um, I just wanted to take a moment to let the public know that you can only speak um, one three minute um, period for each item on, um, on the agenda. Um, yes. So due to that, we have no further raised hands. Okay, thank you, Eileen, appreciate it. Um, so I'm bring it back to the to the to our panel. Um, Raisa, this this always is an issue, especially now. Um, and we have another um, item uh, on our agenda, which will have the same kind of question. And it has that does have to do with capacity. And we're, we are dealing with we're still dealing with the fires. And um, we've got the, 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 the pandemic and our, our, our the current financial condition, although it's been slightly alleviated by some of the monies that are coming in from the, from various government agencies and and a new new city manager that needs to be hired, et cetera, which is maybe maybe um, not as as time consuming. It's certainly not as time consuming as these other issues. What do you what is your opinion about capacity? And and Jeff, you, I would you know you you touched on it, um, but what what do you think about right now about our ability to dig into this particular um, issue? You know, to be honest with you, I mean, it's um, in order to do it right, I would want to do it the way we did with minimum wage is have it fact based, um, look at um, the numbers and the data. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I have concerns about our bandwidth, but it's not just the bandwidth within staff um, uh, at the staff level, but it's also um, the bandwidth with uh, uh, of putting this um, a policy like this right now as we're trying to rehire and get these processes going for the businesses. But specific to city bandwidth, um, I do, to be honest with you, have a concern about it. Um, this would take a lot of uh, time and effort. And I think it would, um, you know, we've got two people, myself and Raphael, uh, who work on these kinds of things. It would mean that we would have to really withdraw from some of the other things that we're doing to really focus in on this. And so I think that's where I start with the question, like, do we actually have this need right now in order to address this? Or is this something, uh, is it not intended to be specific to COVID? Um, because we're seeing the rehirings happen, um, I think faster than, uh, than we would have expected, I guess. Um, I, 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 yeah, we don't have the band. I mean, to be honest with you, we don't have a lot of bandwidth. Was that, correct me if I'm wrong, was that, I think you mentioned that was part of Petaluma's concern? It was part of Petaluma's concern. And actually when um, uh, the speaker mentioned that, um, that they're bringing it uh, up uh, next week, I uh, quickly texted uh, Ingrid Alverde, my counterpart in um, Petaluma to ask. And she said, she's not sure at this point um, that their city attorney is taking the, or one of their attorneys is taking the lead. Um, so they may be looking at it. 
um, but I don't know what their timing is. And um, I, I can add to that if you like. I did have a conversation with the uh, city attorney in Petaluma since it had Petaluma's name on it. It was scheduled to go before them. And then after we, we talked about it, he learned that maybe there's only two hotels in Petaluma or a very small number uh, that would actually be impacted by this. So I think he was going to have some further discussions internally. And I don't want to be uh, sharing things that I shouldn't be sharing, but I think that's probably pretty common knowledge. So I think they're just taking a look at it. I'll also mention, uh, I hadn't heard of AB 84, so I quickly looked it up while we were talking and it seems to have similar provisions to this. I don't know what the likelihood is of the state passing it. I will say that I was aware that there was a bill pending last year and the governor vetoed it. So um, I don't know if they're trying to restructure it a bit or you know, they're, they're bringing it back now. But that, that's all I know about it. Thanks, Jeff. And, and then my screen froze, so I'm not sure. It froze for about a half a minute there. Um, so, Victoria and Eddie, um, um, I don't think you've had a chance to, to weigh in or, or yeah. at this point. So, um, please, by all means. Uh, do you mind if I jump in? Oh, please. Please, do, please do. Okay, great. So, the way that I look at this is probably not going to be any surprise to, to anybody listening here, which is um, one of where, well, first of all, I want to express my frustration with the position that cities have been put in. I saw an article just the other day about the massive amount of mayors across the nation who are um, choosing not to run for reelection next year because of the burden that has been put on cities as a result of leadership lacks at the state and federal level. And to me, this smacks of one of those examples of where the state had a bill that could have been implemented in a way that would have been timely and given certainty to both business and workers. And the governor chose not to sign it into law for whatever his reasons were. Um, but you know, time and again, cities are being asked to step in and, and do work that normally we um, we you know, would have the time and resources like we did with minimum wage to do. And so um, you know, I am very sympathetic to the fact that our economic development department is overwhelmed, but, but I always come back to you know, what is the power dynamic here? And in, in this situation, we have a, you know, a predominantly, we have a workforce that is vulnerable, um, and is predominantly women, is pro predominantly women of color. And they have these jobs that, that frankly, in an industry that, that is more likely to be um, difficult on, on women and, and is not, you know, the, where the people that are most vulnerable don't have an ownership stake in what's gonna happen to them and their outcome. And so what I, I don't love about this is that it's, it's very limited, it's very narrow, and, and it solves a very specific problem. That being said, that the problem is so compelling that I would be um, hard pressed to, to, um, to turn a blind eye to it. I do understand the business argument that it, it is one more step of, um, of work in terms of you know, giving these people a call and, and waiting a, a few days and that there are shortages of workers. Um, but that being said, you know, you call them, you find out if they want to return to work and if they don't, they don't. Um, I get that it, that it adds, um, you know, one, one step of work and, and that that's just a huge pain in, in this environment. But the, the flip side is that we have people who, generally speaking, are, are not going to be able to find work that's going to allow them to continue to pay their mortgages and raise their families and live in Sonoma County and and these folks are the economic drivers um, in terms of you know, the, the money that they earn goes directly into our economy. These are not people with big savings accounts and, and other resources. So um, you know, it, I feel really torn because I, I definitely hear both sides of this argument and I, and I feel um, like the, the issue around staff time is really concerning to me, but um, I'm going to be recommending that, that we go forward with trying to protect the, this group of workers and, um, and that we do so in a way that is mindful of, 
of the constraints of staff time, as well as the, the needs of business in, in getting back to work and that it's not overly onerous, that it is, that we, we don't have to put into to, um, to law the same thing that other people or other jurisdictions have done. We can keep ours quite simple and, and make it, you know, uh, such that, um, that we, um, Sorry, I, I got distracted, um, but um, we can keep it quite simple and, and hopefully not make it too onerous. Um, but I do appreciate all, all of the comments. I'll wrap up there. Can, but can I ask you a quick question? Um, because I mean, I think uh, I hear what you're saying because I think that's the same thing that why um, raising the minimum wage, like expediting the $15 per hour minimum wage was, was good. I mean, it's relevant across the board or was is remains relevant across the board. Um, specific to hospitality in our locale, is is this with the data that you're hearing? And I because if you set aside whatever, it's going to take time for staff, whatever it's that you know, we can set that aside because we can figure that out, right? Um, I'm sure at the same time business, the hoteliers can figure out how to how to, you know, do the process of this, but looking at the need specifically, are you hearing that? Because I'm hearing something different. Like I, I, even before we were looking at this, I was speaking to um, a general manager of a hotel and they raised their rates because they were worried about competition, about losing it. So like, is this really a, an issue that you're hearing? Um, are you hearing something different, I think, than what I'm hearing? Um, because I'm not opposed to it, but right. I'm 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 concerned about the, yeah. the and, and so you know I don't know what what you're hearing. Um, what I what I'm hearing. So I think, and I don't. So I'm going to make an assumption here. And feel free to smack me down if you're not hearing this. Like let's just be real with each other. Yeah. Um. So I don't know that we hear from the same subsets of people. You know, I I think that it's well known that that people that that workers and labor groups reach out to me quite frequently and that I do hear these concerns. And I don't know how many of those types of, I'm sure that labor groups reach out directly to you, but um, do workers reach out directly to you? To you? Cause I, I have a feeling like you're hearing probably more from the business side yeah. than the employee side. And so I just don't know if we're getting the same data. No, I mean, I think, but, but the thing is, is like, yeah, I, I 100% agree because I don't tend to get the calls from workers unless it's like, can you help me? Like the calls I get are like, I don't feel like my employer is being fair, you know, especially about minimum wage. Like I get a lot of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, but, um, but in terms of they're not hiring me back, no, I don't get those. I get um, a, lot, um, a lot more of the, um, we don't have enough, uh, uh, our workforce isn't big enough. Um, we can't hire fast enough, um, you know, and it's not just limited to hospitality. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, like, I think it was last Thursday, and um, they're saying, you know, look, we had to seriously consider closing because we can't even hire people. And they're like, we'll take anybody <laughs> uh, and we pay better. Um, that, I think that's the issue that I come, that I hear most about is this anxiety about not having staff. And I think the, the thing is, is like, um, you know, I, I'm not hearing, cause I've asked, you know, is it an age thing? Is it a this or that? Cause again, with minimum wage, people thought it was young people, but it's not, it's mostly older people. It's mostly head of household people. Um, that just doesn't, I'm not hearing the same anxieties um, or seeing the same data yet. Um, uh, from from the people that I'm hearing from. Oh, and also um, I did a quick um, ask and it's actually only 13 hotels that have more than 50 rooms in Santa Rosa. We have a lot of hotels, but only 13 of those have more than 50 rooms. So we would be affecting um, of the hundred, well, I don't know how many um, lodging uh, establishments we have, only, if this would only affect 13. Right. And so, you know, to, to that end, like, you know, it's a much smaller and sorry, there's somebody operating um, one of those awful yard implements outside. I can't tune it That's out. That's another ordinance. I know. Can, can you, <laughs> I know it's not, Brad, Jeff, just plug your ears. When can we deal with that? Um, but 
geez, I need to figure out how to get people. Like my mom is texting me while I'm like on the Zoom and I'm trying to respond. Like, oh my gosh, does anybody have that problem? I'm just yes, like, yeah. Ah. You know, don't text me. I have a 16 year old. I'm like, okay, <laughs> dimmer down. Sorry. I, I, this is so important. Okay. So anyway, um, unlike minimum wage, which impacted, you know, untold numbers of business. Okay. We've got 13 businesses here. We've got a particularly vulnerable group of people who many of um, them would have been covered under their, their collective bargaining agreements. Um, you know, I start to wonder then, you know, how much time resources would it actually really take? Do we have to get gather together a bunch of data or we can we just say you know it's these 13 businesses it's these workers that are incredibly valuable to us um yes it's this extra step can we how can we make this step not to own us on business and protect this group of people so that we can have these mortgages paid and these workers families lives not more disrupted than it's already been um in, in our city that that's i guess where i stand with with it did I answer your question, Ray? So I feel like yeah. I mean, essentially, I mean, I think, I think, um, I think the the big question is really, is it are we confirming, you know, and because it, there are two sides of the coin, but the, the question is the same: Are people really not being rehired because of age? I mean, again, I'm hearing closer. I mean, I don't talk to the chamber about this, but I mean, when I talk to people about the uh, uh, hotel uh, groups about this. Um, you know, a lot of times the older workers with more experience are actually more beneficial. Like the cost, even if they make more, it's right. worth the cost. So like, again, it goes back to, I don't, I don't even in some ways care about bandwidth, right? Um, it really comes down to, is it, are we answering something for this location? Because I don't right. doubt it's an issue in places, <laughs> but right. for us, is it an issue? Right, and so I don't know that we are gonna be able to prove that specifically um, that it is or, you know, without doing the kind of research that you did for minimum wage here. And I'm not sure that it warrants it exactly. What I would say is this, is like the hotel, the hoteliers are saying, we are having trouble rehiring people. People who work at the hotels are saying, we're not getting recalled based on our age and gender. But let me just ask one thing on that, because I did hear that in the comments. Sorry to cut you off. But the thing is, is like making them the right to recall doesn't make them hire re faster. If the business it cannot sustain an employee, is hiring them faster going to sustain that business? Um, so, I mean, it's I think that they're rehiring, but they're rehiring cautiously because we don't know. Like we've gone through so many ebbs and flows with COVID that we've rehired and um, and then had to let go. Um, so is it, I mean, I guess I just want to even question that, that premise. So questioning the premise, which premise? Cause well, I, like I, I always so. have like nine different premises going <laughs> at once. I if, think if, it was, um, sorry, Eddie, can, go ahead. Can, 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 I, can I interject on that one? It's not sure. that the ordinance is, is saying you have to rehire everyone now. I think it's what it's stating is if you decide to rehire, here's the, the, the list of those individuals that you should call first. So we're not forcing the employer to hire, but when they do decide to hire, these are the individual who want you to hire first. Yeah, I think I was, yeah, you're right. That's what the ordinance is. And I think somebody, one of the public statements was like, no, we need to do it faster. I'm like, doing it faster isn't gonna help. <laughs> like, we just don't know, we, uh, we don't know when. Yeah, so thanks, Eddie. I think that that just kind of is exactly what I'm trying, I think clarifies, it's just like, if you're gonna hire, call these people first. That's all that I think that we're like asking here. I, and, I, and I hope that we can maybe just keep it that simple. Yeah. And if they don't respond, they don't want to come back to work. That's also fine. Like, you know, okay. And, and I believe to further that, that comment, I believe there's uh, a period where you call a, a block of employees and give them an opportunity to respond that I do want to take the job or, or they can actually reject it and say, I've even found another job or uh, I'm not ready to, Go back to work yet and, and this is definitely the option and, and i appreciate the comments that were made before me and i'm looking at this from the perspective of a business person it's at and we've heard it uh i'm echoing what i've heard during the comments it's absolutely logical that i would hire those employees with the most amount of experience it's absolutely logical that i want to provide the customers with a great service and that has to be done by having enough staff to do so uh where, where 
I definitely relate this conversation to the conversation that council, full council had a week ago in regards to the tenant landlord issue. In a perfect world, we would definitely see the benefits of each other and how we're supposed to be helping each other. But we have job security and the stress of what if. And when we're looking at the population, especially those in the hotel industry, when we're looking at over 650 employees, uh, 13 times 50, I believe that's the map. And a lot of the employees in, inside these establishments are older age, are, are, are higher in the age female uh, employees. It does cause concern. And when we're looking at the, the, the ability for them to find jobs elsewhere, after having placed so many years of service in these establishments and these entities, I definitely understand why they would have that concern. And I think as council, I, I'm still learning what the duties of council is, but I feel that is it is not so much looking at the workload that we're looking at or looking at looking at, but that one individual stress, that one individual's plight, and, and to definitely give that individual a voice. And if that voice for us is simply to say that our position as council is to make sure that those individuals from the hotel industry consider to the value of those employees, especially during the pandemic uh, era, I definitely would have to side for, for that for that side, even as a business person, because I do want to get or receive and employ the most experienced employees. Thanks, Eddie, and, and, and thank you, Victoria, as well, both for your recommendations and frustrations of, of, of government in general, especially at the state and federal level. Um, I'm wondering, um, Raisa, so be, I can hear if, if we were to bring this before council, I can I can hear um, a conversation that might start from the very concern that you have, which is a battle of the of the of the, of the statistics, if you will. Um, given your relationship um, with the uh, with the very with those thirteen hotels, how much time do you think it would take? Um, because it's quite, I do believe the question will come up about the need. For, the, for, this, for this ordinance, how much time would it take to contact those 13 and ask them about their policies and if they would be willing to, to be, um, if they would be willing to go public with their policies around rehiring those that have been laid off. Um, my concern is, I, I, and I, you know, it will come no, as to, no surprise to anyone sitting here, um, that go government overreach is always a concern of mine. And as a former um, business owner, uh, it, it, I think that honed my, my concern about, about that overreach. Um, the draft, and, and Victoria, you mentioned that we could always come up with something simpler, and I think that's true, uh, because the draft that, that I read was, was um, I kind of, I f first thought I could just read part of it. And as soon as I read some of the, some of the whereases, uh, it made me read it page to page. And I really did. Um, they always get you with the whereas, right? <laughs> and my eyebrows were up to my, uh, my, my hairline, which is of course Your getting higher and higher as we speak. <laughs> So I'm, I, I know that they're gonna be asking for the, where is the need? What is the problem we're solving? What is the reality in, 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 our, in our current area? So how, how hard would it be to ascertain um, the attitude of, our, of those 13 um, hoteliers or hoteliers? I kind of like the, the fridge twist on that, Victoria. <laughs> yeah. Very astute of you. Um, so what do you so think, fancy. Raisa? <laughs> I, I can, I mean, if, if I have maybe um, a few weeks uh, just to make the rounds and to make the calls. And I think the other question, if I may, if Jeff wants to speak in here, I mean, there are certain things where I know even from um, the minimum wage ordinance that we took them out, like the promulgation or the things, there's some things, there's a lot of um, uh, elements of, of, of handing over to the city that we might want to uh, look at as well. Uh, and so I, I give that to Jeff for his legal review of it. So do you want me to speak to that now? Yeah, if you do mind. Sure. So, oh, yeah, there, if I so may, it, John. <laughs> please, please. Like this is, that's, that's why we, we like the lack of formality. It works. <laughs> so, so this right to recall ordinance, um, you're, you're fairly accurate in your understanding of it. This, this draft from labor does uh, obligate the city to do certain things, including the city manager's office to provide some notice. Um, it provides for a private right of action, kind of like we did with the sick leave ordinance, but it also says the city could bring the action. So those are two areas of, of further uh, city involvement. 
So I would want, if, if, if we are going to bring an ordinance um, uh, to the full council, maybe you could give some direction on those issues. The other piece I'll point out, and we really have kind of not talked about the right to retention ordinance, which the scope appears to be not COVID, but just anytime there's a sale, there's a section in the right to recall ordinance that says not only will layoffs trigger it, but a sale of the hotel will also trigger it. So there's, there's a lot of the devil's in the details a bit. I also want to define what a laid off employee is, just so you understand. And it's somebody who's worked uh, at least six months. And by the way, it excludes managers and supervisors um, uh, who were separated after January 31, 2020. So the uh, employer will be required to notice all folks who fit that category uh, that, that they are, um, that, the, that this ordinance was enacted. So they have to give that notice. And then when they decide they wanna rehire, they do it in order of seniority, whether it's one at a time or more than one based on seniority, kind of like uh, 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 Council Member Alvarez was saying, it's, it's seniority based. And then as, according to the draft ordinance, they have 10 days whether or not to uh, accept or reject the offer. And, and again, I'll remind you that there is this parallel track of state law that uh, was just amended uh, by the state Senate um, some days ago. So there's that parallel track and the, and the ordinance uh, crafted here by labor seems quite similar to the, to the state law. It'd be great if they moved fast and were done and took it off uh, our plate as council member Fleming was suggesting, but obviously don't know what the, what the, what this, what the track on that is and what the governor will do and why he vetoed it last time. I don't, I don't know. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Eddie or Victoria, do you have any questions on what Jeff just presented or, or Raisa? Uh, more than a comment. I mean, when we look at the, the right to retention after a sale of a hotel, what, what, what does it do to, to the firing of a, a full staff? What does that do to our economy opposed to uh, the 90 days or, or, or that, are, that the company has to, to retain the, the employee? And in and, and those 90 day period, would it give the employee an opportunity to show the employer that they are worth keeping? Uh, so so I, I, I'm afraid I don't understand the, the intricacy of the limitations of government. And you're right, uh, John, and when it comes to business people, we definitely look at the overreach of government as something negative to our ability to, to thrive and, and, and have the crew thrive as well. But I definitely do worry about having to fire a full crew for a hotel once it's being sold. And, and the 90 days makes sense to me. And again, in the perfect world, we wouldn't have to have this discussion. And it's kind of sad that we do have to have this, this discussion. Thank you. Well, um, at this point, I, I'm not sure how to move forward. I mean, if, if we have a, um, I, I could entertain a, a motion to bring this to bring this to council to bring a recommendation to council. Um, do you, I, do you want me? Um, sorry to jump in. Do you want do you want me to come back with more information? Like those questions you asked, is that helpful, or would you, do you come back here? Because then it, the question is, do if we hone in, if Jeff and I were together and figure out what the um, legal issues are and the data. Is it better to come here or to go directly to council? Well, it's chicken and egg because I think what they're going to ask is they're they're going to be asking those questions: is what is the you know, what is the impact, um, what is the and what is the need? And so even bef be before I would think, I, my guess is even before they would decide on moving forward with, uh, they may even I mean, this is the chicken and egg part. Are they going to say we don't like it already? Um, we don't want to dedicate staff time to that research, or they're going to say, we need the research before we make a decision. And it's kind of hard to know. Um, I mean, personally, I would like, I, I would like to be able to have that contact with, the, with, those, with those 13 hotels and find out what their attitude is, because if, if, they, are, if they are really struggling on, to finding people and, and people are making more money on unemployment than they were work, than they are working, which is true in, in many cases with the, uh, rest, with the restaurateurs, 
um, they're having a hard time finding employees because they, they're making more on unemployment and, 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 and other ways as well. Um, not that that's everybody, so that I, I don't want to, to cast that broad brush where it's inappropriate, but that is a part of our reality. I'm not sure what, what, what the council would, would, would recommend, um, uh, whether they're going to wait for more information. I mean, I would like that, but then it does delay the decision. Uh, it would delay bringing it to council. Um, Victoria. Yeah, so the, the issue that I have with the, the focus on the data is not that it's not important. It's that in this situation, we have an issue of time. Linus, and if we ask it to come back to this group, then it's going to put it another month off of council. And that the, to John's point, the, we kind of have a sense of the questions that council might ask. And I think that, you know, clearly we, we're not all in agreement or torn. I think this is an issue for the full council. Um, I love that we're doing it publicly. I know this is not an easy thing to do, but if we can just sort of collect the data and bring it to council and let the council batted around, I think that that would be the, the fair thing to do. Well, I, I, I can't argue with that. I mean, I think it's, it's, works, it's, it's a difficult situation regardless of which way we move. I mean, um, I can Eddie, almost guess which was, council members are gonna say we don't have enough data and which are gonna <laughs> say we just have to do it. I mean, I could, I could probably give you the, the full council meeting right now, but. Um, you know, we, it, assuming it goes to a study session, I mean, we have a six, week lead time I think it is even uh like study sessions keep moving out uh, so I mean it we might still be able to come back here <laughs> hone oh. in a little bit <laughs> um but I do have to get the staff reports in early I think I think it's six weeks yeah it's it's being pushed out further and further as, as time yeah. goes on um so I, I, given that um perhaps I mean I can see that I I can see the, the direction and what, what, what I would ask and, and you, I, you, you know, everyone or you both my council members know how I feel about this, this particular one. I'm looking for more information as well. And it looks like we might given, given the lead time that we're already dealing with, and it's not going to, I don't, do not believe the, that it would um, stand the test of urgency. I don't think Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's not, that wouldn't push it faster. Um, so by the time it gets to us, uh, well, it would have to uh, to a study session. So um, I can uh, assume then that Victoria, you or Eddie um, might be bringing this up for future council discussion um, to provide a little bit of background and then um, state state the state the um, state the case as you see it, and then let the council um, make a decision. Uh, and then we'll, we would be uh, somehow getting on the calendar. Uh, and, and then in the meantime, uh, given that long lead time, which is um, frustrating no small number of people on our, uh, in the organization um, and council as well, um, that we might have the information that they're looking for by that time. Um, so if, if that's if that's okay with you, we don't need to take a vote. Um, I, you know, just just a willingness on one of you, Victoria, or you, Eddie, to, to bring this forward um, uh, as a future item for the council to discuss. Absolutely, if I could, okay. absolutely, if I could, just highlight the, the sure. plight of a sixty-one-year-old uh, lady who who might not find another job elsewhere. That's definitely who. I'm looking after. And that, you know, and that that resonated with me as well, that I think probably of, of all of the, the commenters, um, that particular issue is is of concern. And that's why it would, it would be, um, it would be great to get a, um, a, a kind of t a litmus test, if you will, to by contacting those employers and finding out um, assuming that they are willing to share that information with us, um, that would be that would be helpful to me because I did I, I felt for her for sure. So I think um, then you uh, one of the council members Eddie it sounds like it's you uh, will bring it up to the place and then I can work behind the scenes with staff just giving a heads up and start looking for a date. I think yeah. that works. Can I ask a procedural question, um, John? When you asked sure. um, that one of us will need to bring it up, um, is that different from us as a committee recommending that the council take it up? No, no. Well, um, no. We could, it, could, it could be either one, but, but there would be, but it would, but it would need to be stated that it was not a unanimous recommendation. 
Okay, so um, that's the only difference, I think. Can we just, for sake of simplicity, then just yeah. take a, a vote? I don't want to put you in oh, a sure. spot because I know that you know, but just so that we can just get it directly going where we that need makes. To go. I'll put that a motion on the floor that that, that um, we take this issue to the full council, and I'll and wait I'll, a second from. And we have we have a second, and if I could have a roll call. Oh, so, Jeff, can I just clarify? You're talking about both ordinances. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, that 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 we um, bring this issue to the council is more specifically, because the ordinances, I think, I think that the ordinances we might need to re rework and when we have more information about, since it's specifically 13 businesses, maybe it won't need to be both ordinances, but um, that we just take, that the council take an, a full look at this um, th through a study session. That's my recommendation. And, and I would be fine with both uh, ordinances uh, included in that conversation. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so if I could get a, um, um, Eileen, could you um, take a roll call vote? Apologies, I was on mute. Um, so, uh, Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Councilmember Fleming. Aye. And Chair Sawyer. No. Thank you. Okay, thank you both, um, and thank you all. <laughs> um, so what I'm, th we are now at 11.33, and this meeting was supposed to last an hour and a half, and if I can, uh, I think I'm within my, my uh, um, what, my ability um, to continue, is it, would it be recommended, Jeff, to continue this meeting so that we can deal with 3.3, uh, the PLA discussion? Um, given how long our last one, um, and it's, it's important, it's, it's, they're important discussions. So it does not surprise me that, that, that the um, that 3.2 took as much time as it did, but 3.3 um, will take even more time. Uh, we might even uh, make that, a, 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 well, um, Raisa, if we were to make that a single item uh, for, next, for our next meeting. Um, yeah, um, we can do that. I might have to have, um, just for um, parklets, um, I, I might just have to take 10 minutes or something like this just to let you know, uh, because frequently what the city manager wants is for us to have um, reviewed something at a subcommittee meeting. So I could probably do that in 15 minutes and then we could take the rest of the hour and 15 minutes for PLA. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and Jeff, is it okay? Can I just, should I continue this or should I, because it is on our agenda, 3.3 is sitting there um, undiscussed. Um, or do I just um, uh, close this meeting and put that at the, at the top of our agenda or near the top of our agenda at our next meeting? Uh, the latter, you can just close the meeting and, and have it on the next agenda. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, my apologies to those that may have been looking to, to um, weigh in on 3.3, um, but we, this is a council day and we have our, our schedules are fairly tight. So uh, we will take up the PLA uh, discussion um, uh, on, at our next meeting along with the parklets as well, being parklets being the first item. And I thank you all for being here this afternoon or this morning, and uh, we will see you at the council meeting this afternoon. Thank you. Thank okay, you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye.